go for a, a walk to the wharf. Do you want to come? Definitely. Sweet. Let me get that for you. It's locked. Uh, not a problem. I don't want to go anymore. Are you sure? How come? You literally just said you wanted to go. But, it was open. But it was locked, and it's just a huge mistake, and it's really embarrassing. Oh, it's totally cool. I unlocked the door. It's open. We can go through now. So. I deserve to be alone! Like you saw in the video, sometimes uh, we get stuck in this place, right? Hard to forgive ourselves. Hard to feel like we can move past a mistake. Or in the case of a believer, we call it sin. How do we do that? We're in a series called Practical Barriers to Faith. And in the first week, Pastor Kevin talked about how we can have questions about the Lord, questions about the Bible, about God, and all of that, and still be faithful believers. And then Jeff Manning came from Michigan, and he, and he shared with us how we can have that contentment and that satisfaction in our hearts while we're believers. And, and he really, he highlighted how the Apostle Paul did it when he was in prison. And he said, I'm content in prosperity or poverty. And the, the believer can also have that, that that could be a barrier to faith. Then Pastor Kevin uh, came back again and he shared a really tough message about what the Bible has to say about sexuality. Um, following that, we had Pastor Howie share something that's near and dear to his heart. And that is, you can still have fun and be a Christian. And Pastor Howie's a fun guy. So that was a great message for him to preach. Last week, uh, Pastor Darrell spoke of prayer. And in that speaking of prayer, he helped us see that prayer is not a series of magical incantations to manipulate powers to grant us what we want. It's a conversation with God, and it's an understanding that his will for us is what we want above all things. And it may not be what we want in the moment. This morning, I'm going to talk about another barrier to faith, and I'm going to remind you of something that most of you already know. Peter calls it that in the book of 2 Peter. He says, let me remind you of what you already know and are firmly grounded in. So over the years, I've been a marriage and family therapist for over three decades. I've been a pastor for, gosh, 13, 14 years now. And there's a particular kind of issue that people come up with against all the time, and it's a barrier for believers often, and that is the sense inside that they're still not forgiven for something they've done or a series of things they've done. They're just not forgiven. And, and it's really a, a painful thing for them, um, and it hurts them emotionally. It hurts others in the relationship. It can stall life. It can delay uh, uh, what we need to do in moving forward with our life. And it's not the unforgiveness uh, that goes on between people. Like, I've wounded you. I ask your forgiveness. You won't issue it. Um, those kinds of things. This is about us and Jesus. Where do we stand in terms of receiving the forgiveness of Christ? And, and I know this well. I know this well. I wasn't raised in a family where we had any uh, particular religious leanings. Um, in fact, in my family, Christianity was seen as... Um, Troublesome, a problem full of hypocrites, double-minded people, um, and you got to stay away from them. And then when I was 15, our family fell apart, and I was basically on my own. And I got into trouble, and I don't mean like got caught stealing a Snickers bar. It wasn't that kind of trouble. All that's troublesome. It was bad news, really bad news, and that's another sermon someday. Ah, but anyway, it's, praise the Lord, I'm here. And then at 18, I met some guys right after high school that had come to Jesus, and they helped me understand who this Jesus was. And I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, and it changed my life. I mean, this burden was lifted off in a heartbeat. It was. And it was amazing to me, and I just drove my mom and stepdad nuts talking about it. Mom, do you know Jesus? You guys want to get to know Jesus? Come on. Do you have a Bible? Let's get your Bible. Let's open your Bible. And they would say, don't you have something to do like 10 miles from here? But in five months, I got in an argument with someone in my group of friends, and I left that little church. I know that Jesus didn't leave me, but I left. 
And you know, it was amazing. After a period of time having left that, all those things I had done that were relieved for me sort of crept back in. And I was carrying the weight and the guilt again of the things I'd done. I just was. So I know what that's like. I don't live in that place anymore. But sometimes, you know, it pokes me on the shoulder. It does. And see, I know this morning that there's people in here who struggle with this thing of forgiving oneself or being forgiven, living that way. I know that. I've asked groups of people for the last several weeks, do you guys struggle with this at all, now or ever? Every hand goes up. And if it isn't you, there's somebody you know who's close to you that wrestles with this. This sense of I'm not forgiven. I know what it says, but I just, I don't feel it from the inside out. And this morning, I want to equip us to change how we work with this forgiveness of self thing, to change the flow like a river that was going this way, and now we're going to go that way. That's what I want to do this morning. And I want to encourage you, if you've been working on forgiving yourself for a long time, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to quit. Knock it off. Stop it. Give up. Drop it. Forget about it. If it was going to work, it would have worked. I really do. I want to encourage you to give it up because the work's already been done. The work has been done, you see. We can't do the work of a risen Savior. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And maybe with yourself or with those close to you, close to you, you've already tried everything you can think of. What you've done is you've said, okay, here's why you're forgiven. Here's what the Bible says. You've got to work on this. Can we encourage you? Let's give you scriptures. Another late night conversation. You got to take it in. And then eventually you get caught up in being angry about it. Why won't they listen? Why won't they do this? That's a problem. I want to encourage you to stop that as well. But there's another problem with this. I call it enabling. I've done this, and I don't like that, but I have. I know some people who've just not forgiven themselves. They're Christian. They go to church. They read the Bible. Yeah, I just can't let go. I can't forgive myself for certain things. I can't. I've enabled them. Like like enabling a friend who always has a sore back, and you go, well, it's just Bobby. always has a sore back. That's just how it is. Or that's Floyd. He can't stand the smell of broccoli, so we never have broccoli when we have Floyd over. We treat this in others sometimes and in ourselves of, that's just my hang up, that's just my problem. And so now you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? Guys, it's a huge deal. It's a massive deal. It's huge. Because from Genesis 3, when we're promised reconciliation with God, there's been a plan in place for God to restore his children to himself. And at one point he gave Moses rules to run a temple so that you could take animals there and make sacrifices to atone for your sins. And it didn't work. You'd atone for your sin and you'd sin on the way home and plan your next trip. And then the people administering it, the Pharisees and the leaders, got distorted images and views of how things should work. And they got off track. And so we knew that a thousand years before the time of Christ, we began to find these prophecies in Scripture that said, one's coming because what's happening now isn't working. And the one that's coming is Jesus. It's a huge burden. See, if we don't understand that we've been freed, then that sin can crush us. And I want to give you a picture of what that crushing is like. In ancient England, they had a way in their legal system that they would get a confession out of somebody who they suspected of a crime. They would have them lay flat and they'd put a weight on their chest. And now that was supposed to inspire a confession or something. But if it didn't come, they'd put a second weight and then a third weight. And you can imagine what would happen. If you didn't confess or they didn't believe and you were lying, you were crushed to death. That's what sin does. If there's not some way to get free, That's what it does. So what does scripture tell us about this? And why is this a barrier to our faith? If you have your Bibles, please open them to the second, second Peter, first chapter. In this book, Peter is telling his readers what to do because scoffers have come against the Christ-centered church. They have said, hey, I thought Jesus was going to return. Where is he? Maybe he's not coming. 
And Peter can see this is a huge problem. I've got to remind people of the truth. I've got to repeat that reminder of the truth, then repeat it again. And that's how we live, isn't it? Nobody gets in their car when they leave here and says, okay, key and ignition. Let's see. Um, parking brake off. You don't have to. It's instinctive. It's part of you. Through practice, reminders, reminders, and repetition. So here's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. For this very reason, add to your faith goodness. Add to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance. And to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection. Some Bibles say brotherly kindness. And to mutual affection, love. For if you possess, here it is, these qualities in increasing measure that will prevent you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you do not, or he who does not, is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that they're cleansed of their past sins. How is this a barrier to faith? Catch the beginning of this sequence, faith, and the end of the sequence, love. We heard last Wednesday night from Dr. Darrell that, that Jesus emphasizes over and over and over again, I'm sent because God loves you. Next, love one another and they'll know you're believers by that. Love your enemies. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the reality. God isn't a loving God. God is perfect love. But God is also a perfectly just God when it comes to our sin. We've got to work this out. But then we understand that he worked it out for us. So you see, if I have unforgiveness inside, and I'm holding on to that, it blocks me in this sequence. Can I really get to be as loving as he wants me to be and needs me to be and others need from me? Peter says, no. We can be nearsighted and blind. Nearsighted, in this interpretation, more so means short-sighted. And blind is blind. It doesn't work. So it's important to know in Scripture, too, that we're not cherry-picking these verses, we need to know a little bit about what comes before and a little bit after. What we hear right before this, it says his divine power has given us all that we need, everything we need. It's already been given, has been given, all right? Then, <clears throat> excuse me, after these verses, he says, again, let me remind you of what you already know and are firmly grounded in. In fact, I'm going to remind you again. In fact, I'm going to leave something in place that will remind you after I leave, what does that tell us? People then are the same as people now. We need reminders and we need to repeat the reminders. I'm reminding you and repeating everything today for you. I'm just doing what he did. And why does he do it? Why does he do it? For God so loved the world. There's that word, love. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is why Jesus came. And what kind of love is it? Our sin separates us from God. God, who loves us, couldn't stand it. He can't have that. He wants us close. He says, I'll provide a Messiah for you. Believe in Jesus, receive him, and he will become sin, which he did. And he'll die in our place. He paid the price I don't have to pay, that you don't have to pay. Romans says that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And all sin and fall short of the glory of God. It was love. It was love. That's why he did it. For everybody who turns their face to him and says, Abba, Father, I received Jesus, this is what we get, the free gift of grace. So how could a believer come to church? How could a believer hear the message, know Jesus, read the Bible, be in fellowship groups and serve and still not know this, sense that they're forgiven from the inside out? How could it happen? Let's look at some of the causes. But first, I want to tell you what the causes are not. Again, I've been a psychotherapist for a long time and a pastor for about half that time. So I looked on WebMed. I looked on Psychology Today. I looked at the Mayo Clinic websites. Every one of them has a plan for how you can learn these tricks to forgiving yourself. They really do. You know, it, it doesn't work. I know that. I was in that clinical field for many, many years. But you know what it points out? Even non-believers know how important it is that we get freed up. Right. Even non-believers know that. It's called a universal principle. It's from God. So let me tell you what it isn't. If you're stuck with a wheel in the ditch 
and you don't feel forgiven, you don't sense it, you know the Lord, but you don't feel it, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not physiological. It's not chemical. It's not genetic. It's not biological. It's not geographical. There's no research to support that if you're stuck in unforgiveness, it's attributed to one of those fields of study. It's not. I believe with all my heart it's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. So what are some of the causes? I'm going to list some up here. Maybe they won't be the ones that are yours or the persons close to you that deal with this, but let's walk through them anyway. Number one, I can't excuse the terrible stuff I've done or still do. Guess what? You don't have to excuse it. Don't even worry about it. What you do have to do is own it, be convicted, understand what you've done, feel the heartbreak of it, and repent. Turn away from, commit to never doing again, and you're free. You're free. Number two, I live in the guilt zone. I can't imagine living anywhere else. I know people that, people have already told me after first service, I know I just feel so guilty. I feel so guilty. Guess what? You are. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you. Unless you're the second one who's without sin, you've committed sin. You're gonna commit sin. If you're waiting for the day that you don't sin anymore to feel that freedom inside, it's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. Number three, it can't be that easy. Oh, yes, it can. It absolutely is easy. And it's hard. It's both things. It's a weird tension. It's hard because we have to submit ourselves to the reality of Jesus Christ. We have to put me underneath him. That can be hard. But the gift is easy. I don't have to do anything to earn it. I receive Jesus, and it's like, here, I love you. Here, I want you to have this. Go ahead, take this. You're free, okay? Then we spend the rest of our life in sanctification, learning how to live to become like Jesus. Next, and this is true. Some people will say, I don't really understand all this stuff about grace and new covenant. Grace, we say grace at our house. I don't, it's not working for me. If that's the case, then you or whoever you know, come study, approach somebody who does know, come under some discipleship and mentorship, learn. Five, I haven't earned the right to be free yet. Earned it. Like it's units in an academic course of study. Like it's progressing three levels at your job because of your hard work. People feel that. I, I felt that. I haven't earned it. Which, and, and, and coming with earning it is a right. You earned a right. That's a human system. That's not God's system. And number six, this one's hard. This is really hard. I'm just going to say it. Pride. Hard as it is to say, uncomfortable as it can be, we have to look at pride. How does it work? There's at least two ways. One kind of pride is, is this continuing to hold on to I'm not forgiven, I won't forgive myself, self-punishing by saying things like I'm an adult. I don't back away from what I've done. I man up. I take my lumps, I grip my teeth, I pay the price and I keep doing it because what I did was wrong. I'm not going to shy away from taking the hits. Doing it for years now because that's who I am. There's almost a pride. I've heard this. I'm not making this stuff up. Another way that pride comes into it is I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'll do it. I'll handle it. I don't need Jesus. I'm a fully grown adult. I have a college degree. I can handle things. I have a savings account. I have a nice house. I can do stuff. I'll handle it. You know, Jesus really needs to spend his time with those less fortunate than me who aren't as capable as adults as I am. It's how it works. And then there's the language we use. You see, when you're, when you're holding on to that unforgiveness and you feel stuck and it's inside, there's ways you talk about it with yourself and with others. There are sentences we say. I'm going to try a few here. You got more, I know, but I'm going to put the ones I thought of up on the screen. Number one, that allows us to hold on to unforgiveness of self. I really did forgive myself, but it came back. It keeps <laughs> creeping up. I don't believe that. Sorry to say, but I believe what we do is we leave it there, walk away, then we go back and pick it up. It doesn't creep. We go get it. Two, next, I forgive myself. I forgive myself lots of stuff, but there's a few things I can't quite get over. Like there's a scale. 
right? And you can do this, but you don't reasonably think you can forgive yourself for these kinds of things. Yeah, I do. Next, I'm working on it. Our staff know that that phrase just bugs the snot out of me. I'm sorry, it's a pet peeve. It's not in the Bible, it's me. But you ask people year after year, how are you doing on that? I'm working on it. It's a tactic to delay you and get you to shut up because they've done nothing. But anyway, I, so I threw it in the list. Sorry if that bothers some of you. That's just my personal thing. How about this? And the next one kind of bugs me too, I got to say. I know I'm forgiven here, right? But don't feel it here. I got news for you. This is physiology. That's a muscle. It's not a brain. You don't have, well, your feeling thing is here and your thinking thing is there. It's all here. So what does it mean if you combine it? You don't get to leave them separate anymore. It means you know intellectually the truth, but you don't feel inside. Great, we can work with that. But using it as a reason to say, I don't, yeah, forgiveness, because I know it here, but it's just never traveled. <laughs> Ding. It's not reality. How about this one? I'm having a bad day with forgiving me, myself like forgiveness is hair. <laughs> you don't know what I've done. You know what? I don't. I absolutely don't know what you've done. I have no clue. But I know somebody who does. And if you think for a second that he can't forgive you, think again. Or if you think for a second, well, if he ever figured this part out, I'm in big trouble. Then he's not God at all. He's like a bigger, more powerful neighbor or something. <laughs> you don't know what I've done. The person I hurt won't forgive me, so how can God? This is a big problem. We live in a world that is often reluctant to forgive. After what you did to me, you're not getting off the hook so easy. You're going to pay. That happens. And we can get caught in that. And that's hurtful. And, and, and it's harmful. And, and it hurts the relationship. And the relationship may not be repaired. And you may have got these things mixed up. You may be thinking that I can't forgive myself because they don't forgive me. Yes, you can. Because you're not in control of them. You'd love to have them forgive you and let repair take place. But you got nothing to say about what they do. He does. Leave them to him. But he's already told you that you're forgiven if you've embraced Jesus. You are forgiven. So you may be in one of those pickles where I know I'm forgiven. I feel it from the inside out. It makes me very, very sad that they won't forgive me. But you're still forgiven. I thought I, here's another one. I thought I did, but now I'm not so sure. That's the insecurity of being human. Ah, I don't know. Did I really? I can't, did I really do it because I'm having a feeling? How about this? If I just ignore what I've done, it kind of makes it okay. And I can't do that. I can't give it a seal of approval. I have to stay angry at myself. I have to stay disappointed with myself. And if I stay angry at me, and I stay disappointed with me, it validates the weight and consequences of the wrong I committed. That's not biblical. There's nothing biblical about it. Or I'm just so bad, forgiveness doesn't apply to me. Have you murdered people have you set crowds on homes and raised those homes and sent children and families scattered? Have you destroyed their belongings? Have you had people thrown in jail? Paul did. The Apostle Paul did. His career before the road to Damascus was a zealous, passionate career to ruin people's lives for his beliefs. And the Lord forgave him in a second, pulled it off of him. He pulled it off. How about this? I tried it. Didn't work. <laughs> or something like that in Star Wars, right? Remember, it's one of the old movies where Luke is at the swamp and Yoda's right here. And he goes, Luke, you can do it, Luke. However he talks. That's not how Yoda talks. <laughs> is that a Yoda voice? I don't know. But he goes, Yoda, I'm trying, I'm trying. And what does Yoda say? No, he says, Luke, there is no try. There's only do or do not do. So stop saying you're trying. And this last one, I haven't done enough good stuff yet. I haven't. So I got to pile up good deeds. I got to do good stuff. I got I to gotta build a big pile and then cash them in, you know, like chips at a casino or like the old blue chip stamps, and then you get your reward. That's human thinking. It doesn't work like that. If it ever worked like that, we don't need Jesus. If we really have a way we can do this, we don't 
need Jesus. He's really what some people think is just a great guy who taught a lot of cool stuff. And I hope that's not you this morning. <clears throat> so I want you to know, if you're a believer, you got a choice. You got a choice. I want to challenge you on something. If some of these causes appeal to you or apply to you or others you know, if some of these ways of talking to yourself are the ways you've talked to yourself, if you've been trying, if you've been working on it, I want to encourage you to quit. And I don't want to hear again, this is my pet peeve, I don't want to hear you ever say again, I can't. When it comes to forgiveness of self, I can't. Here it is, this is hard, don't be mad at me. Because what you're saying is, I won't. I won't. Not, I can't. I can't means I haven't figured it out yet. I'm telling you. I'm telling you right now. I'm not opening up a door to a mystery that you're going to need 50 years and a climb to the top of a hill of the monastery to figure out. The Bible's telling you. This is God's word. He tells you. It's I won't. Sorry, but it's I won't. It's not I can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So here's the new language. You ready for it? Here's new language. This is really important. And again, you can make the choice to use this new language and reject the old language. And if you don't know Jesus, you can make that choice. You can say, I, I got to meet him. I want this gift. I want to know that I don't have to carry this anymore. I want him to rule in my life and in my heart. If that's you today, make that move towards Jesus. Here's some new language. I accept forgiveness, the end. Pretty poetic, huh? You like the way I phrase that? The end. How about this? The forgiveness of Jesus covers everything, no matter how rotten. And I may not feel it today, but it's as real as ever. Your feelings have nothing to do with the reality that, in fact, historically... He became sin and died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb. The rock was rolled away and he rose again and the tomb was empty. Then he reappeared to over 500. Your feelings have nothing to do with that. My feelings have nothing to do with that. It's a reality. It's a historical fact. Do what you want with it. But your feelings don't make it true or not. How about this? It doesn't matter what kind of day I'm having. I'm forgiven and it's true. It just doesn't matter. Your day and how you feel by the end of the day, how it went, shouldn't help you feel or sense or be more forgiven or not. You're forgiven. It's done. How about this? I'm not ignoring what I've done. I own it. I repent, which means own it and turn away from, and I accept his forgiveness. And this one, I'm not too bad to be forgiven. That's a lie. Let me just say this. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. That's straight from the pit of hell. That's a lie. How about this? I can't earn it. I can only accept it. There's a truth. You can't earn this. How are you going to do it? You can't. Nobody else has been able to for thousands and thousands of years. You can't either, but you can accept it. I'm not trying anything. I'm accepting his forgiveness. I'm not trying it. I'm accepting and I'm forgiven for everything, not just a few of the lesser things. You see, we can take the energy that we've been using to work on being forgiven, to work on forgiving myself, pull that energy back. And when Peter says, make every effort in our verses, turn your effort over to, how do I get closer to Christ? How do I spend more time in the Word? How do I spend more time connected with people who can disciple and know these truths and help me really grasp them from the inside out? We have to repeat it. We have to remind ourselves. Again, nobody gets in a car and does that and says, okay, key here, brake, see wheel, see engine. There's an engine, yeah. You've got to turn the engine on. Nobody does that. You get in and you drive by instinct. You just do it without thinking. This can become like that, but not without reminders and repetition. God built us this way. So what else can we do to move forward towards accepting his forgiveness and sensing it from the inside out. I got four things I've listed. There's a hundred more. There is, but there's four that came to mind. I'm going to put them up. You can look at them. Number one, receive the forgiveness of Christ. 
When we fully realize the nature of our sin and the incredible sacrifice Jesus made for us, it should melt our hearts. See, here's an important key about sin. We tend to think of sin as, well, sin is, you know, I, I hurt Bob and Bob's upset, so I gotta fix that. I sin against Bob. I sinned against the law, I cheated on my taxes. I sinned by going 100 miles an hour just for fun in a 65 mile an hour zone. I did all kinds of things, whatever it is. I sinned. You know what scripture tells us sin does? Sin breaks God's heart. It breaks his heart when we sin. That's hard to hear. That's the truth. It breaks his heart. But then we move to what? So, so I'm a sinner, and I do these sins, and, and, I, and I've done all this sin in my life, and it's breaking my father's heart, and I can barely stand at my father, my creator. Love himself is hurting. And he said, that's no, all right. I'll give you Jesus. He'll die for you. And that awareness should melt our hearts. You see, that should melt our hearts. Number two, apply this gift to ourselves. Apply it. Open the door. Stop working. Just open the door and let it in. And then once you have it, number three, give it away. Forgive others. Give it away. Don't keep it to yourself. Forgive others. But if you're living in a state of unforgiveness, but you say, yeah, but I'm good at forgiving others. I just can't forgive myself. Stop right there. Stop right there. Make every effort to move to Jesus. You want to know that your forgiveness is really powerful? Apply the truth to yourself. Then you can know what you're giving from the inside out. Number four, maintain and grow in forgiveness. This requires daily reminders of his incredible gift. Daily meditating on the word. Being with others who know this gift. Others who know what this is talking about. You want to be around him. You want to know what it's like for them. You want to hear from him and be with them. And then consistent prayer. Consistent prayer. Not magical incantations once a week. Not just grace before meal. That's terrific. But this constant conversation with your Lord, the one who created you, with the Savior, inviting the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you constantly. Because that's what you did when you learned to drive. You worked on it and worked on it until it got easy. It's the same here. I'm going to read you something. This is hard. But I'm going to read you. This is hard. I love it because it's hard. A blogger named Chad Bird wrote a response after being encouraged by a number of people in his life to keep working on forgiving himself, keep working on forgiving himself. Try this, try that, try this technique. And he finally wrote this. He says, you know, for a time I believed such advice, no more. I know now that to forgive yourself is not only impossible, it's foolish, dangerous, and futile. It is the vain attempt of a soul plagued by guilt to seek relief in the very last place he should be, look, he should be looking in himself. Telling a friend, forgive yourself, is the equivalent of telling a dying person, heal yourself. Go ahead. Absolution, like medicine, comes from outside of you, from the hand of a healer. And he he finishes by saying, my problem was not that I knew that God had forgiven me, but that I hadn't forgiven myself. That wasn't my problem. We think that's our problem. No. My problem was that I'd never truly believed that God had forgiven me. And that's the issue. That's our issue here today. It's a spiritual problem, folks. Forget about working on it. Turn your effort towards accepting what's the work that's already been done. See, Jesus wants you to be free. He wants you to live an abundant life. He doesn't need us to be mired in this this, this yuck and muck, this quicksand of unforgiveness. He said, I'm gonna become sin and die for you. And then on the cross, and I'm gonna be entombed. This is all prophesied. And then the tomb's gonna be empty. Then I'm gonna reappear to you so that you don't have to do that. It's free. It's my encouragement to you to this this morning. I encourage you to stop working on it and encourage you to open the door and allow it in by moving closer to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. I, I can't even imagine what our lives would be like if all this time, whatever age we're at, all the sin that occurred in our life would have been accumulated. And, and say a cart behind us that we're pulling or a backpack that we're wearing or weights on our chest. And we just tried to kind of hang in there till the end. Lord God, I thank you so much. You love us too much for that. You sent your only son that he would die for us. And he did. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Your word says. So this morning, Father, if anyone here needs to just stop working, to rest from the work, and turn to you and embrace the work that's already been done, Father, would you make that happen? And for anyone we know that we're related to or in association with, in a relationship with, that, that struggles with that, would you help us approach them and encourage them to open the gate because you want us to be free, free to love this world in a way that points to Jesus and free to live out the joy that you have for us. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray these things, trust you for these things in advance. Pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.